Thank you. Victor, can I um, come to you? Uh, from the perspective of a health minister, um, how do you think about gearing up for an, econo- for an epidemic? Well, what is the process you go through? What is the time it requires to get prepared? Um, what's your perspective on that? Thank you very much, Peter. After, after hearing James speak, I, I think what I'm going to say will actually be superfluous. But I just want to, to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to look at it in three distinct blocks. Uh, first of all, to give a little bit of a perspective to the Ghana situation and to make very clear that we didn't have a case of Ebola. Um, so our preparedness planning was a bit different from what um, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea went through. So looking a little bit at the perspective and then a short bit about the the history um, of our preparedness, which started decades before this uh, immediate um, challenge. And then I'll come to your specific question about what we we actually did. So just to give a little bit of the perspective for Ghana, um, you know, a few years ago we were declared a middle-income country, you know, artificially, I think, because there was some rebasing. What that meant was, and then we also um, discovered oil, which meant that um, uh, the percentage of uh, uh, revenue that makes up the GDP rose from 16.1% to about 19% because of the oil. But in consequence, donor uh, inflows also um, were reduced significantly from about 2.8% of GDP to 1.1% of GDP. Now, Ghana as a country has been putting a lot of money, exponential growth in the amount of uh, funds we put into health. So we have, for example, um, $1.1 $1.1 billion going into health every year. The challenge with that $1.1 billion is that we put it in to solve certain problems. So you have a third of that money going to our national health insurance scheme. We have a third of it that's to increase financial access. We have a third of that money also going to pay wages and salaries because we wanted to increase coverage and geographical access and so we train more people and then one third also goes um, into what we call internally generated funds which help help to run the facilities. In consequence, there's very little that is free money to do the kinds of things that we've talked about today. So there's very, it's very difficult. It's not out of place to find that in Ghana sometimes we would run out of vaccines and so on and someone would ask, but you have a, a, a billion dollars, why can you not you know, buy vaccines? But just, just painting the picture. And I think many other African countries have gone through um, the same thing where they've been declared middle income and they're still having some, some disparities in, 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 in what the money is being spent on. Now looking at the history, you know, where we are right now with our health system has been guided by past epidemics. So yes, we did some preparations, you know, last year, but it started decades, you know, earlier. So, you know, we've had challenges with avian flu. We've done some things in the past on avian flu. We've done some things on cholera and and many other things. So we have what I would describe as a fairly robust system where we have a national technical coordinating committee, which is a standing committee of all the technical experts who meet to discuss um, issues around uh, diseases. We have an interministerial body which provides the the policy. What we learned from this, from the Nigerians and also from from the US was to set up a coordinating body which was the emergency operations uh, center which I happened to head so that it became the coordinator between government and then the technical people because we learned that in Nigeria for example there were challenges with providing funding quickly with coordinating the, the response. Now what did we specifically do. Like I said, we had started decades ago. So if you look at the uh, Ghana's health system, we operated what we call the sector-wide approach, the swap, where we brought all the development partners together many, many years ago, around which uh, the table around which we had a discussion about what things to fund, what not to fund, DFID, US government and others had helped us over the years to build a fairly um, robust system which strengthened personnel, strengthened the infrastructure, strengthened um, collection of data and and all that. That had happened uh, way before. We had also put in legislature, legislation like our local government act. We decentralized our health um, sector. So we have at the district level, district health management teams. We dedicated resources from the center to strengthen these um, health management team. So when we had to prepare for Ebola, then it was just building up on these systems. We also have our reference labs and so on. 
So what we did from the time that we had Ebola was just to then put in place a specific three-pronged strategy to prepare against Ebola based on what we already had. And the three-pronged strategy was a public education, point of entry screening and strengthening the surveillance and contact tracing and preparing for case management, so building specific ETUs. What I want to stress again was that this was just building up on things that we already had. So it took maybe three months for us to get our public education in place, but then it has taken us up to about nine months from the beginning of when we started our preparations to build specific Ebola treatment um, centers to get people to be trained. We sent some of our personnel to Liberia and Sierra Leone to have hands-on um, 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 experience in the, um, in the ETUs. So two or three lessons that we learned. Number one, that the preparation was not overnight. It took a very long time. Number two, that funding is important, but it's not the only thing. And you must know what you're going to use the funding for. And number three, I want to go back to, to, to what my former boss from the Global Fund, Lelio at said yesterday about you know, when we start, and I worked at the Global Fund, we, we had that mistake of just throwing money at problems. And sometimes that's not what you need. Because the real way that you will use to, to, to channel the goods in, in, in good times is the same real way that you would depend on when the emergency comes. So it's better of fixing that railway so that when the emergency comes, you have something that you can deliver on. Just building on those comments about the sort of practical challenges. One of the practical challenges people talk about is that in, a, in an acute emergency, there's huge pressure on the health ministry officials and, um, and at the same time, donors are asking for all sorts of additional reporting requirements, data collection, and, and so there's a bit of a challenge of how do you absorb all that and get on with the acute tasks. How, how do you think about um, sort of how you increase the absorptive capacity um, on the ground at these times of acute pressure. And, and make no mistake about it, Peter, it wasn't only on our side, even amongst the development partners, there were wild turf wars, even you know, within the UN system, you know, WHO not talking to UN, it's, you're not talking to UNICEF, you know, so it was a real challenge. But then again, these things had, were in place way before. I talked about the sector-wide approach which meant that we have a history in Ghana of sitting around a table with a government-owned plan that, you know, government in the lead discusses and decides what the priorities are, and then the donors have to fall in place. They are the core donors who will give the money to government, and they are the peripheral donors, and I don't mean that as a slight in any way, but they are who would then buy into the things that have been decided. One of the challenges we had, and I don't want it to sound as if it was all rosy, um, because coming from the Global Fund, I only assumed this post uh, a year ago, and things work at the Global Fund. I got into Ghana and realized that sometimes you just don't have the capacity. You don't have the people to prepare the plans and so on. So the challenge was not about coordination per se. It was getting the instruments around which we could have the discussion. So yes, the development partners would say, we want an up-to-date Ebola preparedness plan, and then we would you know, have our discussions and arguments and so on. But then there was that central like watering hole around which we all gathered to have a discussion.